coming up in this episode. Without naming names, but there's been some very well-known companies that were like the the love child of the of the pandemic, did exceptionally well in how much they raised in the valuations, and have now been sold for basically less than our valuation right now. We and, work. Well, <laughs> I, I, I don't care about naming them. We but that's, you know, that's, <laughs> that's what we're talking about. about. And so when you get a large fund where you know which has an enormous amount of people working there, enormous amount of you know, analysts and associates, and you know this and that and that, then you know there's a lot of busy work happening, mm. um, and uh, not and and everyone's scared to be the one to to make the wrong decision at a time yeah. of crisis, <laughs> and no one wants to put their job at jeopardy in a time where everyone's being laid off. Yeah. Exactly, and I think even there's other kind of more traditional but risky kind of ways that you can invest. But in the US, where there's been trouble around, do people understand what they're investing in? Yeah, and I think that is such an important part of access without that understanding is is it's unhelpful at best and dangerous at worst and totally. the founders unplugged podcast hosted by greg mccallum raw uncensored conversations with startup founders there we go recording has started there. right um, yeah how are you i'm good thank you i'm good would you like me to uh, wear headphones because i can put on my airpods or whatever they're called if that um, would be no, no, it's fine. There's no echo or anything. So no, no, you're all good. If you're if you're comfortable not having them on, don't feel that you need to just because I do. I, I do it more to block out any other noise than anything else. So I'm just going to close my door. Sure. It makes me feel weird having an open door behind me. I don't know why. Um, yeah. So uh, so how have things been since we last spoke? Yeah, busy. It's one of those. I think it's several weeks ago we last spoke, and it feels yeah. like like yesterday. So, <laughs> <laughs> like time. I don't know. I don't know how time works because it feels like it's moving at a completely different pace since like starting and running a business to what yeah. I used to run at before. I don't know. I don't know. We always, me, and my co-founder always talk about that of like. I hate time. Time is like this weird thing of how is it one month on? How is it one week on? How is it one year on? But um, yeah. but yeah, other than that, all good. What about you? Uh, yeah, similar sort of thing. <laughs> Still wondering where all the time has gone this year. <laughs> um, exactly. But uh, yeah, I was actually explaining that to my son recently. He was, what was he was asking about? Because we, we, yeah, we've got a, he's got a new brother, right? And, um, and he's going to be one in January. And it's oh. like, he was just born the other day. And like, my son was like, how was he almost one? Like, you know, it's just so baffling. And I had to explain to him, like, some time is weird like that. Like, you know, some things can feel like they j happened just yesterday, but also like they've been around forever at the same time. Yep. And it's such a weird phenomenon, you know. Um, I completely agree. Yeah. I, yeah. It's all part of the matrix. None of it's real. It's all a simulation. I'm convinced of that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Because, like, like you said, I know I know exactly how busy you are and, and, and how much you got going on. So, taking the time out to chat to me is, is very, very much appreciated. And I know you've got a lot of really interesting stuff to share about you, about your journey, about the business and all that. So we'll get into that. But um, but there is really only one element of structure to this entire thing, which happens right at the beginning, which is I ask all my guests to basically introduce themselves um, in whatever capacity they want, detailed, not, you know, however they feel comfortable. And, um, and telling the listeners and watchers a bit about obviously yourself, but also about the business um, and to just to kick us off and then, and then we'll get into it. Um, so take it away. The mic is yours. Sure. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, but yes, yeah, so um, I'm Felicia. I uh, So I used to be a fund manager. Um, I used to work in financial services on the buy side, managing people's money for about eight years uh, with a large asset manager based in Scotland. Um, and then I left, I left Bailey Gifford um, to start Tillit. And essentially, so I'm the co-founder of Tillit. And what we try to do is we try to help people, personal investors like you and I, to be in control of their long-term investments, but have everything they need to make great long-term investment decisions. Um, and so that's what Tillage is about in a nutshell. There's loads of different ways that we go about trying to do that. Um, but ultimately, what we're trying to do is build a platform that really changes the way that people look at long-term investing, feel that they that it's an accessible thing to do, it's a natural thing to do, and that people, um, we kind of bring those barriers down, which are kind of the industry does a great job of covering everything in jargon and making it feel like it's not for me and I don't know what I'm doing and people feel stupid and all of this stuff is just not necessary. So we try to bring a more human approach, a more 
real straightforward kind of plain English approach without dumbing anything down. Um, and uh, and that's essentially what we're trying to do. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, well, thanks for the intro. So, I mean, Leah, it, it, like you said, there's there's a lot of a lot of jargon in this in this industry, a lot of confusing things, and there's a lot of people out there with money that they want to put in safe or well, safe places maybe isn't the right word but they they want they want to make sensible decisions right and and they you know quite often people will tell them you know look you've got a bit of money you should invest in something you know um so yeah what, what is it you're doing to declutter that all of this sort of noise like i know you're saying you, you obviously want to make it simplified and so on but i mean that's quite isn't that quite tricky presumably because you also need to speak the lingo that there are certain things that you know just you can't change fundamentally about the landscape of investing and finance and economics so like how are you managing to appeal to those is it more about you know you're, you're wanting to go the route of education as well as provide the platform and kind of you know bring people up to speed on these things or or you know how are you going about that to make it I more think accessible it's, yeah i think it's a balance of access in its own right isn't enough and access without education can be a bit um, dangerous even in some cases and we've yeah. seen that in some very extreme cases over in the US and so on and I think access at its core is great I think you know well, we've seen that with crypto and nfts and yeah. blockchain and all that haven't we a, a, yeah. a lack of education a lack of understanding and um and then obviously a lot of people who are taking advantage of desperate people or people exactly. with money yeah exactly and I think even there's other kind of more traditional but risky kind of ways that you can invest whether it's um kind of other other types of instruments that I, I don't want to name kind of platforms and so on but in the US where there's been trouble around do people understand what they're investing in yeah I think that is such an important part of access without that understanding is is it's unhelpful at best and dangerous at worst and totally. and and so I think it's it's finding that balance and I think as any investment platform we have a responsibility I think nowadays the whole industry has come from I think an angle of like personal investing wasn't really a thing and now it's become more more prevalent but it's like the industry hasn't evolved to cater to that investor and make sure they have everything they need to make good decisions and mm. it's just access 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 and pushing people into things um that then becomes a bit random a bit um FOMO driven about kind of pro-cyclical and and the people who lose out at the end of the day are us as, as individuals who are trying to do, make the most we can with our savings and I think so as a platform what we try to do is walk that really tricky balance between making sure that we take out as much jargon as we can and we speak in plain English like I for instance used to be an industry professional right and I understand the jargon but that doesn't mean that I enjoy reading it like I as mm. much as an ex person enjoy speaking English so yeah. in and there's many ways that you can describe these things but of course it takes effort and it takes um it takes time and and that's on you as a platform and you as a team to decide do you want to make that effort and we think it's a it's a really important thing because at the same time it's not about dumbing anything down as i said in the beginning but it's that thing where people feel like because we have investors who some of them have been investing for several decades some of them are completely new to investing now our platform because we don't offer personal financial advice tends to lend itself to someone who's been investing for a while but even those people they come to us and they say i finally am sure that i understand what this means mm. sometimes it's just self-validation no one wants to necessarily few people feel like they want to that they are spoken to as they've taught but it's more you want to self-learn and self-educate and validate what you think you might know already mm. and so it's really important that you give people the opportunity to do that but you don't force it down their throat and that you you build a journey that can be managed and accessible to to you regardless of what your background is and your experiences and that's ultimately what we want till it to be is for people who want to be in control understand how they're invested and make sure that it's aligned with what they actually want mm. uh, so and so, yeah <laughs> yeah no and that's great and 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 yeah we have very much needed um in in a lot of industries not not least um in in the area of people's personal finance and and you know making sensible decisions around that i, I mean because of it, yeah like i mentioned that there's a lot of predatory you know um people and organizations and industries out there that will target people with money obviously because that's the that's the primary target they're the they're the main marks and so um you're you're at risk just by having money basically immediately and uh, everyone's going to do what they can to take it from you so yeah you should at yeah. least uh, be fairly equipped and be supported by organizations like yours to, to help so um that's great so yeah tell me a bit about Matt, your 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 time working in in vc so like um you did that for a, a considerable amount of time right I, I remember you were mentioning before you yeah i do yeah explain a bit more about that 
in terms of my previous career yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yes i i was in that so i i did an internship with bailey gifford which is the name of the asset manager i was with and I did an internship with them while I was at uni and then I wanted to continue on on the grad scheme and I was lucky to get a position on that grad scheme um so I started with them straight after uni and and I think to be honest even at that time I never I was never one of those people like I really want to go into financial services that was not I was very much like I don't think anyone in financial services ever wanted to go into financial services (laughs) but some people are that's like oh I've always wanted to work in this like I was not one of those people right and I think for me, I was even, I remember having those discussions with my friends, you know, when you're at uni, like your penultimate year, and you're looking at what do you want to do with your life? Yeah. And, and I'm what like, what did you study oh, at uni? Thinking. Sorry? What did you study at uni? What was your degree? I study um, at European Business School, which is now called Regents in London. And I studied international business and Russian language. Oh, um, right. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah. So yeah. I spent a year in Moscow as well, which is wild and, mm. and amazing. Um, but so I, so I did quite a broad degree and I wanted it to be a broad degree. Um, and, and I think for me, I was even like, oh, I don't want to go into banking. That's really boring. And I had the view that a lot of people do is that all financial services banking. And it's all very kind of, you know, it's about making rich people richer. And I think parts of the industry is about that. But I think what I what I learned with the when when it was a friend of mine saying, why don't you at least try the asset management side of things? Because it's very different to banking. It's much mm-hmm. more about research. It's much more about analysis. You might enjoy it mm-hmm. and so I'm like i'll do an internship and and i did and i realized in the internship that it my friend was completely right especially with the firm that i was with is that a lot of i spent the majority of my time analyzing companies mm-hmm. looking at kind of analyzing strategies very long-term thinking of like how might this company look in five to ten years time a lot of debate and discussion with my colleagues and it was a very flat structure so i really enjoyed that environment and and that's why I wanted to continue with them. And I think for me, it was whilst I've always had this little thing in me of like, I probably want to start my own business one day. Um, and I was even up front with, with Bailey Gifford about that when I uh, finished my internship. So maybe I shouldn't have been. But um, in that sense, of I had that drive. But this was the closest thing from an intellectual point of view of doing the same. Because whilst I wasn't building a business and running a business, I was analyzing business across industries, across the globe, mm. large, small, whatever. And so it gave me that privileged insight into how people are building great businesses. And so yeah, yeah. I really love that. I really and then eventually as you move on becoming in, from being an analyst to then being trusted to to run money and become a portfolio manager. Is, is a great transition and, and you learn different skills about portfolio management and diversification and risk management and client servicing and all of those different things. But I think ultimately the whole looking at companies is something that I really enjoyed. Mm, yeah, because you must have been getting very gran- granular there um, in a way that, you know, even sometimes working in a startup doesn't quite give g- give you access to, right? Would you re- would you recommend that then as a career path to any other graduates looking to, to maybe get into the world of, uh, uh, of of startups in general, but maybe more, especially more specifically in, in financial services? It's a tricky one. Like, I think I've had this discussion with others around, should you, what's the best route? Do you go into the industry that you think you might want to, if you even know what kind of company you want yeah. to start, which I didn't when I went in there. I thought I'd do it for a few years and up there for eight years because I really enjoyed it. But I think some people have this like, oh, should you work in a professional standard job first and then start a business? Or should you start it straight away? And I think if you have something that you really believe in and you want to go with, start it straight away. As long as you can, yeah, as long as you think that you have this, you are the right person to do this. You you either have some particular skill or insight or a team around you and you are the people to solve this problem. But I think other than that, I for me, I'm a first time founder. For me, it was hugely beneficial to have worked in this industry before because it helps with it helps with credibility. I mean, ultimately, for us to be a platform that we hope uh, to earn people's trust to entrust us with their savings and they pick their investments based on what we have filtered down the market to requires them trusting that we know what we're doing. So right. having real experience of managing money helps. Yeah. It also helps attract other brilliant people that we have in the team. It helps to attract investors. And so I think in that sense it was beneficial to me but i wouldn't say it's a necessary thing if, if ultimately what you want to be in startups um but for me it's been a very interesting juxtaposition um but i think either route works and i think if you're going to consider asset management i think that is right if you're really into research and you like really analyzing companies and and debate and so on i think finding 
an organization that does that very well, I would say, is a, is a fantastic career path. I mean, many people thought I was crazy for leaving, so no one ever leaves Bailey Gifford. So oh, really? okay. I was crazy for leaving, but you know, <laughs> if that's the kind of thing you like, then I think it's a it's a career path definitely worth exploring. Yeah, it's funny. It's interesting. You said two two really interesting things there that, that that stood out to me. Um, the first was you know if you think you're the right person, mm. and that's really interesting because. I don't, I don't think I've ever met anyone that, that that would acknowledge the fact that they're not the right person. I think everyone thinks they are. So how can you how can you separate you know yourself uh, to to look at look at yourself objectively in that way? Everyone thinks they're the right person to to to, to spearhead their startup. I've met very few people in my lifetime who have had the the self awareness to be like I shouldn't be running this. <laughs> I've got the idea; I can maybe get it going, but then I need someone else to come in. And then the other thing you mentioned about um, about sort of you know your particular path being appropriate for this startup, like that's that's a really important thing too. Like there there, there are some people, there's quite a few people actually I speak to founders who who want to enter into an industry which is not gate kept, but mm. um, similar to this requires connections it requires a reputation it requires you need something and while it's, it's absolutely doable it's you're just at a disadvantage immediately <laughs> you know <laughs> and, and so it's just like okay you know, you're gonna have to do the work eventually so you might as well just do it first and then get into it yeah you, you can you couldn't run something like this i don't think if you've had zero experience in in in, in fundraising or, or in the financial sector people would just be like well who, who the fuck are you, well, <laughs> you know? some, some people do I'm not right sure. yeah some people do and i think there's particularly in fintech, there's been a, a, an inflow of people who come from the tech side, and that's great. Yeah. But I think with financial financial tech, it's very important that there is also expertise and experience on the financial side. And, right. and, and they and they usually do that. And, and you know, they, they usually bring that in, right? Uh, yeah. So, so you know, but, but, but then, of course, you know, it's, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I suppose it does happen. But... Different approach. And I think ultimately yeah. the whole, the whole, are you the right person, as you said earlier? <laughs> I mean, it's very hard to be objective with anything, but I think particularly if you're trying to build a business, you ultimately have to believe, like we all, I think most founders go in not knowing that the odds are completely stacked against you. Right. right? You know, yeah, yeah. You're, you're I mean, to be fair, to be fair, that's a good thing to bear in mind for anything you do in your life. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think we forget yeah. that it's like it's all fucking stacked. To, we can swear on this, by the way, it's fine. Yeah. It's all fucking stacked against you. Like, just bear that in mind. Like, yeah. nothing is going to fall on yeah. your lap. So, yeah, yeah, you know, I think that's a good good approach. It's like in general. Yeah, it's one of the things I've said, which is like the key to happiness is low expectations. And it's like you know, right, that's right, right, right. You know, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. you expect that things will fail, and um, well, so you, I think as a founder, you can't you can't expect that you you know the data, you know the stats, but I think if you you need to so much more than anyone else, the whole not quite fake it till you make it, but there's an element of that, and like you have to really really believe that you will succeed because it'll be so damn hard to get to the end yeah. goal that if you don't believe more than what is one than what a reasonable rational person would do then there's no way you're ever going to get there you might but there's, but there's there. got to be a foundation to those beliefs like it can't be it can't be to the point of delusion like you know yeah. like you yeah. know have, have think, high expectations of yourself low expectations of others and i think within that then that way you know you, that you avoid disappointment but you're also always setting yourself a higher standard to yeah. strive to be better as opposed to just yeah. I expect for things to work because I believe in them. It's like, well, no, if they haven't worked, you need to strive for, for being better in order for that better outcome. Yes. If, if, if that Absolutely. Sense. I think is is the balance of knowing what your blind spots are and what your strengths are. Right. And I think with those blind spots, so for instance, like I'm not, so I did a coding course after I left Bailey Gifford before I set up Tillip, but that was because I was curious and knowing how to code, like how does that right. work? Yeah. But it was never because I thought I'm going to learn how to code and build a, you know, <laughs> from a technology angle, an investment platform, never yeah. in a million years. And so some of my blind spots, one of them was very much for this to work, we need to build very reliable, very robust and, and um, um, what's the word, not flexible, but um, uh, well, agile. agile. Agile, yeah, <laughs> see, should be a agile technology to really support people to to make great decisions. And that mm. the platform needs to work. Like it's not like we're selling some like something that really doesn't really matter. It's people's money. You can't, you can't go to an MVP with something like no, this. No, right? yeah. that's a really interesting angle as well. That in this industry, me and Paul, my co-founder, we talk a lot about this, and is that the MVP in financial services is so much higher. The M. Yeah 
it's so much higher, A, because of competition, but fundamentally because it's regulated, it's serious, it's people's money. You cannot, you cannot just like, you know, fly by the seat of your pants and hope for the best. It, it kind of needs to work. So there's so much that goes into building what is an MVP mm. compared to another industry, and especially when it's B2C, when it's when it's dealing with individuals. Mm. And so I think that is very tricky. But that that just just to make kind of come back very briefly onto that, are you the right person? I think if you are going into one of those industries where experience matters, like it's a regulator, whether it's healthcare, whether it's financial services, whether it's something else that is very important dealing with uh, individuals or something very serious at the end of the day, I do think there has to be, if you haven't worked in that industry before and you can't show your own credibility, you need to attract that credibility either in your team, on your board, in your investors, mm. whatever it is, because that is ultimately how you show that you're not just believing for the sake of it but there is substance there that people can trust and people can back ultimately and it, and it shows um that self-awareness right because you can you, you can you can say in your deck or in meetings or whatever i acknowledge the fact that i have a blind spot here so because of that i did something about it and i found someone to fill that blind spot for me yeah exactly. yeah it's interesting that the mvp thing because of um yeah, I've encountered that obviously a few times, and it seems actually now that you're we're talking about it, it's like my thoughts are, are kind of cementing a bit. It's it, it definitely seems to always usually usually fall, I should say, to regulated industries where where what we were saying about having experience is necessary, usually necessary, or bringing in those experienced individuals early on is necessary, and and the way that your MVP is, uh, <laughs> like you said, a, a capital, very very big M um uh there is is always uh, applicable and ordinarily as well i've noticed um a, a, a much different route in terms of fundraising right mm. because if you, you 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 need to build a much more robust product which means you're not really going to be able to bootstrap that and and, yeah. and build that in your basement with a couple of mates it's it's more of the kind of those are the ones we see um that get sort of large uh you know seed uh, pre-seed rounds um secured by by vcs um you know in the millions often because they, they need to be and because they understand that there's a huge potential there so um, yeah yeah which, which i understand you were successful in raising um your seed last year right yeah so we raised we raised two rounds so far we raised our pre-seed okay. in, the, in the very exciting time of right in the middle of covid uh in the beginning of covid oh, wow. so that was, yeah <laughs> so we we raised um our first round in well we closed it in october 2020 started mm. going out to raise in june 2020 which was when everyone thought still the world was going to end and you know in the beginning of that covid um pandemic um and everything that came with it so with that point we raised we set out to raise five hundred thousand because it was not a time to raise money but i was also running out of savings so we didn't have a choice and and to get anything off the ground i thought okay the, what is the minimum amount that we need to raise to be able to get even an mvp out and i and i based on my calculations at the time was like oh that's 500 grand turns out that that would never have been enough and so <laughs> actually we ended up raising a million which was fantastic and we got incredibly lucky with the supporters that we had and the investors that we had to be able to do that and especially in that environment but i think a lot of that came down to people really believe that this industry need to be disruptive and need to be delivering something better for end investors and yeah. And I think there's a lot of excitement around that and around how we approach that with very much a customer centric um, focus and, and all of that. So that gathered momentum and, and we managed to close that round. And it turns out in hindsight, a million is what we needed to to, to build a, an MVP. Yeah. Um, so I think so we raised that and then we raised our seed round um at the end we actually closed on christmas eve 2021 so um so that was um almost two years ago now um mm -hmm. and then we raised 3.6 uh, million for that so yes in comparison to average industry round sizes yes we raised a lot more than what you typically see for a first and second round and that is very much as you said a reflection of what is you just need a lot more money to be able to get to any kind of foundation mm. um with, within financial services especially if it's directed at, at b2c and you're and you're presumably looking for you know experts in your field to be to build continue to build your founding team right you you, you know even even maybe your choice of devs you're going to have to be a little bit more um, picky about that you're going to need to know that you'll be working with a team that has experience in building um 
platforms that have these security uh, measures in place that bear in mind compliance that can work perhaps internationally because i'm assuming i haven't even asked you but i'm assuming you 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 you're operational internationally right we don't actually it's so oh, okay at this stage we're only in the uk the uk okay. is our first kind of because we're still early on in our journey we want to kind of prove the concept in the uk mm. first before we go abroad i think that's also where as founders you know trying to prioritize you know where do you spend your time you yeah. can't fight on all fronts at the same time and so i think for us we're very focused on the uk now it's a great test market there is an interest in investing there's a knowledge of investing it's not but it's also not the most advanced market that there is on, on the globe in terms of investing. There's other markets that are quite interesting there. So I think yeah. there's, there's potential very much so to go beyond the UK, but we want to make sure we get this right first and then and then go beyond. But that's really sensible because again, it's a regulated industry. And and yeah. you know, as soon as you start going into other countries, then you enter a whole world of pain, right? <laughs> and this, and yeah. yeah, and when it comes to regulation, the States is is probably the most difficult one to deal with when it comes to that, because of um, I mean, I'm sure there are more difficult countries, you know, for other political reasons, but like in terms of just state to state regulation is absolute nightmare. I've been involved working with product teams before on that approach when it comes to fintech. And my God, is it mind boggling? Because even the people who live in those states don't understand a lot of their, their <laughs> rules and regulations when it comes to financial services. It's mind boggling. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we think it's complex in this country. Like that's just it's just it's like, you know, 50 different countries, you know, basically. It's absolutely nuts. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you're so you're, you're you've launched in the UK then. So how is it going like you know generally speaking like how how is that what's the reception been like you know what's the feedback you're getting you know I, 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 yeah are users happy are you seeing some some good investment going through the platform yeah i think overall we're very pleased with how it's gone so far overall in terms of, in the context of also we are in an environment where cost of living crisis markets are going haywire have been since we kind of opened the platform up since uh, at the end of 2021 so like for a year and a half now that it's been open to anyone and i think that is a very interesting um world to be building an investment platform in and so in that context i think we're very happy with what we're seeing from our customers in terms of them adding more money they are growing their account sizes they're they're staying long term with their investments they're not churning all of those kind of fundamental good nuggets of like metrics are like moving in a direction that we're very happy with having said that of course as a founder I'm, and and like most founders probably but me personally I'm, I'm very impatient i'd like us to have done a million more things by now but that's that's the nature of, of how you want to you know you want to run really fast and and we do but there's also elements of you're never you're never pleased with everything that that's going on right i think well, i don't know i assume other founders feel the same um but i think so in that sense there's a lot of things that we would like to to still do a lot better at and whether that is for the customers or for investors or whatever it is um but it's it's a journey that's moving in the right direction for sure and when we're very proud of for me one of the highlights is like when we hear from a customer and they say i a bit to what i said earlier but they might be reading about a fund that we have on the platform saying i've been invested in this for over 10 years and i never understood really what it does and mm. now i do and for me there's so much stigmatism around investing that if you've been doing it at all never mind for 10 years or more people assume you know what you're doing and actually a lot of people feel still that they don't really know what they're doing but i have no idea what i'm doing yes, there you go but a lot of people are <laughs> doing that and, and people think, and people pay me to give them advice so, <laughs> i mean yeah it's like the whole it, it, it makes me feel better to know that but they, technically they really don't know what they're doing then, in that case <laughs> <laughs> you value what you know and so on but i think there is this kind of small imposter syndrome or oh, sorry. Sorry. In, with everyone and i think in a lot of things that people do in their lives and i think with investing as well for me it's about it's not just i don't think this is a problem that's solved for people investing for decades either it, we see it day to day from our invest from our own customers and i think if we can resolve that for them it then feels more of a responsible thing to invite new people into the concept of investing in the first place because you know that you're giving them a foundation that will not put them in the same position in 10 years time of not knowing what they're doing still mm -hmm. and i think that's something that for me makes me so happy and so proud that we are building something that people not just like but actually helps them become better and make better decisions and ultimately do more with their savings and be in control of their own financial future and so i think for me that is um, and we get that you know quite a lot for being quite small and i think that is very exciting and for me that's that's the thing if we can't get that right then it doesn't matter how fast we grow it doesn't matter mm. how many 
customers we have because ultimately the product is flawed and at some point that water will come out and you'll see you swim na naked and all of those you know different sayings but i think you have to at the core know that you are producing value and then you have to know who that's for and then you have to obviously be able to scale that to make it a, a sustainable business mm. um, but yeah so a lot more challenges to come for sure but very exciting things to come as well yeah but yeah you're right i mean it's um it's better to 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 be aware enough to know or it's better it's better just to not know something than to um be convinced that you know something that's wrong right <laughs> if, if that makes sense um but yeah so like can you explain then for, for anyone because I, I do have people who listen to this that obviously are investors um and uh you know they're probably very curious to know a bit more about the platform and then equally um maybe individuals seeking investment um so so can you explain in a sort of like ABCs, like I'm a like I'm a baby, like or maybe you know like you're pitching the product to me, let's say for example, um, <laughs> how does it practically work? If I go on there right now when I want to make an investment, how does it work? And you know what about investment opportunities? Can I go on there and list an investment opportunity, or is that that's something that's done you know by uh, by your team? Like, can you can you just sort of break it down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no press. I haven't been pitching properly for like two years, but yeah. I, You've got I, one minute. Go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Elevator, three sentences. Um, yeah. I think so. First, I'll just address your second point first because that's a bit more straightforward. Um, we only offer publicly kind of regulated funds, and right. so in terms of if you're if you want to um, get investment yourself as a as a company or as a fund as, as an investment trust or whatever it is and that is until it isn't isn't uh, able to help with that um what we are about in terms of you know you come on to tillit what can you expect is that generally in the market there are thousands of things that you can invest in we believe that that is too much and not many people have the interest or time to go through all of that so we do a lot of groundwork where we look through the entire market and we try to find what we think are the best options across different asset classes, different regions, different styles, to give you a universe that regardless of who you are as an investor and what your goals are and what your world view is, you can find the best in class funds that does that. And so we then uh, present those funds to you in a way that should be able to help you understand what is that sector more about, but also what does that fund actually do? So for example, we also give everyone all of the funds uh, like a one-liner. So instead of you just see a, a fund name that means nothing to someone, you see something like investing in change makers in private and public markets around the globe. That says a lot more than a fund name that no one understands what it means. But then we also give you a lot more in what we call a tillet view. And that is like an executive summary around what does this fund actually do? Who's it for? Why money, uh, how might it perform in different markets? What are the risks, et cetera? And then we also interview the funds that are actively managed we interview the fund managers and ask them the really tough questions and the questions that really matter around how they make decisions, who they are as people. And so that ultimately you as the personal investor, you have everything you need to make your own decisions because you ultimately make the decisions for what you want to invest in. But we're kind of like the guardrails. We've already done all of the research to show you that what's already presented in the universe has been vetted essentially and yeah. based on our own philosophy and process and, and all of that which we then share with our customers as well and that's a really important distinction to, to make that, 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 that your platform is is focused on on providing access to funds for investors yeah. right not direct access to the to the to the uh, to the end businesses that would be potentially receiving those funds yeah so. we don't do stocks and shares no or crypto right, right, no. right. Um, yeah, and and I remember um, when we first spoke, where I we were having a look at the um, the universe page um, that, mm. that, that that's like curated. Am I right in thinking? And you have to refresh my memory because it's been a while okay. since we spoke about it. But am I right in thinking that this is something that changes based on 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 the individual? Um, that this is like personalized or is this something that's kind of more generalized i can't remember quite yeah so it's not personalized in the way so we are we regulated by the fca um but to essentially offer guidance we don't offer personal financial advice so for instance you can't come up to right. us so it's, it's not based on like your interests and, and your previous activity or anything like that it is just more generalized um in that so sense. yeah so it's kind of in the way that the universe of what's there there should be something that that fits any kind of profile of investor but you can't yeah. come to us and say i have x amount of money this is my time horizon this is my risk tolerance blah 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 what should i invest in and we tell you you should invest in abc yeah. we yeah. can't do that yeah. so we don't give personal financial advice what we try to do is give both general advice um but also guidance and i think that's the thing of 
as the industry overall, everyone's so terrified of the word advice with like capital A because it's mm. regulated and people have stopped listening to what the word we as humans use the word advice all the time. And like, I'd like some advice on this. And so the industry doesn't really let anyone even hear what is someone when they say I'd like some advice. People are like, no, 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 we can't even do that. If you actually yeah. listen to what people need, a lot of the time, the questions that people are asking is not what should I personally be investing in, but like, you know, what's the benefit of equities versus bonds or how, right. should, how should I think about this? And I think that's where we can go so much further in giving you what you need, because investing isn't actually rocket science. It's just mm. that the industry does such a great job. Mm. Mm. So yeah. I think that's what, what we provide you is that guidance and that general advice that is helpful in finding the right things for you. And so the universe is the same. The only difference is that if you've transferred in, let's say you had an account on, on, a, on a different platform before, and you can transfer that to Tillit, will allow you to transfer in any other funds or ETFs and so on that we don't have on the platform. So mm. and then they live in the dark universe. So you can still continue holding that because you might love those things. They might be right for you. We just, for whatever reason, don't want, haven't at this stage offered them on the platform. So you can still see them, but I as a different customer wouldn't see them when I'm looking at the funds in, on Tillit. So right. that's the only distinction I think where you might have a slightly more personal view based on what you've been bringing into the tele platform but otherwise the funds are on show are the same to everyone mm. now that's that's very handy because then it it, it 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 ensures that they're yeah they've got all of that information in one place by being able to bring in their previous uh, uh activity as well so that's fantastic so so what is the like help me understand like um you know i've never invested in a vc fund right i've only made angel investments i started off with micro investments and, and sort of worked my way up from there but i've never i've never done this type of investment myself right so what would you say are the help me understand what would you say are the the, the main um aside from the sort of information piece that we've just talked about what are, what else is the is this really helping sort of uh with solving a, as, as maybe a problem set that you hear about a lot from from individuals who are investing in these funds what what is it that they're they're struggling with beyond that 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 you hear a lot maybe, maybe you're not addressing it now but maybe you will in the future like just help me understand these individuals a bit better in terms of the, the struggles they're going through and 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 what's blocking them from being able to make more of these uh investments yeah so i think um in terms of the core things that we are addressing right now and what till is very much based on is one of it is is that it's very few people have the time or the willingness to spend all day long. I used to look at companies all day long for a living, right. but picking funds and, and that was your job, right? <laughs> yeah, it was yeah, job. Yeah. Um, and it's still incredibly hard. And you have access mm. to so many things as a professional. And even with that, you have access to management teams, you have access to specific data sources, you have access to independent research, you have access to like a million different things. And it's still really, really hard to, to pick stocks and so on. And so what we know that one of the things is that trading in stocks might be fun and exciting, but it's that's more like this is an entertainment thing. I want to trade in and out of Tesla because I'm bored on a Thursday afternoon, whereas long term investing is quite different. And so that's why people tend to look in that situation more towards funds or at least put a bigger proportion of the long term savings in funds. But then the issue becomes this whole thing because there's so many out there. Where do you start? What information do you even need? And you don't have the time. People just get. So it's a due diligence problem, which is, which is the same problem yeah. really across the board for a lot of investors. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. Due diligence, yeah. time to do that due diligence. Who yeah. do you trust? Where do you get the information? All of those things. And I think so fundamentally that time angle and knowing that you make good decisions and also being able to be in control. I think a lot mm. of we've seen some great um i think the robo advisors and and nutmeg has paved the way there and lots of others come after them have done a great job in terms of making it easier for beginner investors to come into the market but what we also see is that after a while of once you have been investing through perhaps a robo advisor they're like actually this isn't so hard or so scary and i'd like to have a bit more control i want to see what am i actually investing in is this what i think it is i want to be able to have more control mm -hmm. and i think that is the issue what we see is that you have the robo advisors on one angle on one end of the market and then you've got these big supermarkets as we call them that offers anything and everything and the problem that also people have is well i want to go from here to here but i don't feel ready to go here and there's nothing here and right. so intentionally sits here to either support people who want more control and want to to have more transparency and making sure that they're confident in in what they're investing in who come from the robot advisor side or who are just fed up being on a on a on a supermarket who doesn't give them anything than just very very broad market access but not 
it doesn't still help you to make that decision. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's the thing of where we see people coming from both those DIY platforms and the robo advisors, because they want to solve that problem of, I want to do good things with my money, but I also don't have the time or interest to sit and look at it every single day. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And those for me are the, the core things that actually, then there's other more specific niche problems here and there. Um, but those are the core things that at the moment is have really been, been solved elsewhere and in a way that people feel like it's, it's helping them. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and and I've got to ask you because I, I get this, I get asked this question all the time um, about the landscape as it stands right now. Yeah, you're you're in a um, in a and obviously a unique position, um, but like a few, you know, very few others that, that people will get a chance to listen to or speak to um, to have a good vantage point as to to the way things are sort of currently shaping up in, in terms of, you know, VC funds specific, specifically and, and whether or not they're investing and what kinds of things they're investing in. I'm not saying you need to give us the inside scoop necessarily, but like, you know, a lot of founders I'm speaking to are struggling and the general sort of feeling out there has been for the past year, generally, that people just aren't investing. Now, I'm not sure if I 100% believe that. I definitely think that it's fair to say it's been harder um but i also think there's there's more to the story right i think there's a lot more startups for one <laughs> so there's a lot more competition which doesn't uh, doesn't help but what what's your perception of things given your vantage point how do you see the landscape has it changed in the last uh, sort of let's say you know 10 months and um you know what's the what's the road ahead looking like do you think from your view um, I'm not sure that I necessarily have more of a vantage point than anyone I, in terms of like the funds that we offer on Tillage. So we offer mm -hmm. funds that invest across different asset classes, whether that's bonds, public equities, private equities, uh, alternative asset classes, uh, property, right. commodities, whatever so it is. So it's a huge, diverse range. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily. So we have in our alternative space, we have some funds that invest in private companies. We have one investment trust that particularly invest in VC funds, private equity, and so on. But we don't um, we don't focus on on giving access to VC funds specifically. So I, I wouldn't have that kind of privileged insight into right, what right. are they actually doing. Um, it's more we can hear from higher level up of people who then are investing in them and LPs and so mm. on. From that angle, but, but isn't it, that an indication as to what they're, they're doing though, in some ways or? Yeah, well, but we're so far removed because we don't specialize in that specific. I, m most right. of our it's just such a small element, right. and yeah, and public equities rather than VC. Yeah. So it's it's a still a small part of the market. So I, I, for me, I think it's the insights of what I see from other founders, what we're seeing. So we haven't, you know, been out to raise since twenty twenty one. Yeah, um, so kind of so out, out of the loop in that regard. Sorry, <laughs> you're a bit out of the loop in that regard. Then, if you haven't raised, for I, that. I, I guess I'm in the loop of as as much as any other founder who isn't raising. But we're all, you know, yeah. it's a small industry. People know each other. You, yeah, yeah. everyone can see how much dry powder the VCs are sitting on more than they ever have been before. And I think mm -hmm. the one thing I can say as being an ex-public market investor, I think personally, I think the LPs should put a lot more pressure on the VCs to actually deploy that capital because the only thing you know for sure, they've been raising so much money, right, to bring to build these really big funds in a lot of cases mm. because they're in a fee on an ongoing basis, never mind the performance fee, but you earn a fee on, on the regular, like on an ongoing basis on the assets in that fund. But ultimately, if you're going to deliver return for your LPs, you need to deploy that capital. The only mm. thing that is for certain is if it's sitting in cash, it ain't going to do that. And so I think as VCs, your job literally is to go off and, and find companies to deploy that in. Mm. And, and one bug where I've always had, and be very honest with, with VCs, and when I speak to VCs, one of the things I ask is like, when was your most recent deal? How many deals have you done in the period when everyone else is shying away? Because you're supposed to be counter cyclical, not pro cyclical. Like mm. the due diligence should be higher in the good times when everyone's throwing money at anything and not the other way around. And I yeah. think. I think as my ex job and, and from that lens, it's just crazy what I'm looking at sometimes. I'm like, you're doing this the whole wrong way around. <laughs> like it's it should be the reverse. So I think that is perhaps a personal frustration based on my background that I have with the VC market. Um, but but ultimately it's just it's way too much dry powder. And there's it's a timeline until whenever, but it can't be too much longer when they have to deploy that. And so mm. Is it then going to be a complete wave in again into the same startups or into the same and you kind of end up in that problem as well where everyone's chasing the same uh the same companies and then you end up with inflated valuations and 
without naming names, but there's been some very well-known companies that were like the, the love child of the of the pandemic, did exceptionally well in how much they raised in the valuations and have now been sold for basically less than our valuation right now. We and work. Well, I, mean, that is I, I, I don't care about naming them. We but that's, you know, that's <laughs> what we're talking about. about. There's also other ones in the private space, um, yeah. which have gone from nothing to to everything in two years, and now back down to nothing again. And I think it comes back to, as a VC investor, as any investor, you want to have a contrarian view. You want to have an insight. If you're putting money in the thing that everyone thinks is is the best thing since sliced bread, you're most likely not going to make a return on that. So. Yeah. So anyway, so that's my own little personal rant around what I think is is wrong. No, but it's it's, it's an interesting insight, and I, and I yeah, and I couldn't agree more. But it's interesting as well because of you know, especially at the beginning of the year, the the rhetoric was less around less around what you're saying and more around the fact that um, the LPs weren't were withdrawing funds or or, or not um, not not yeah, just not. Um, not uh, fulfilling their commitments or, or you know changing their mind pulling out things like that so um you know I, I think it's only there's only so long you can say that when you until you start realizing well that's that's either it must have changed by now or <laughs> or just yeah. simply not the case like um and then there's also like if you feel like you don't have any opportunities whether you're a vc fund or whether you're a public fund that i used to run as well give the money back like it, right it, yeah yeah, give it back then like don't like you know you shouldn't sit on it and earn your fees for doing nothing like i know right. we all need to sit on cash and so on for a while but it gets to a point where it's like well if you can't if you can't find opportunities maybe it's better for that investor to to deploy that capital elsewhere mm -hmm. um so i think it's just as a responsibility that you have as an investor regardless of what type of investor you are if you're managing someone else's money um i think i'm surprised that um i don't know if you've heard of this but i wonder if there's uh you know if, if there should be if lp should be insisting on terms in their investment contracts that 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 is a clause that if if, if their capital hasn't been deployed within a certain time frame that, that it should bounce back to them because if, you know especially in in in, in uncertain times, you know, um, um, as we've experienced in the last few years, um, where these kinds of situations could arise again, and yeah. you know, people, we've become we've become educated on them. Like, I, why not insist on that being a being a, a clause? You know, I agree. I I, I agree. I think that, I think there is so much more that LPs can do hmm. to, to push for like a better allocation of that capital. That's so I, I I would welcome that too. I think that would be sensible. Yeah, sure. they 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 ultimately hold the power. Exactly. Um, but but also what you're seeing is um that i've noticed is is a lot more funds pop up and and i think um a lot of that is because um for the, for the exact problem you're mentioning you've got these lps sat there just going like what the fuck are these guys doing and they're saying give me my money back we'll do it ourselves like me and a few others will just do it ourselves and we will find these businesses that we want and and so you know they're not creating themselves any favors there by um essentially just creating new competition like you say with contrarian thinking with with the the, the appetite for um for, for going for I mean the, the 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 riskier you know looking businesses in, in quotation marks marks you know that kind of thing, um, but yeah uh, it's it's very interesting but but yeah I'm I'm distinctly aware of the fact that that's a, you know only a very small part of yeah I, I read something interesting actually the other day now don't quote me because it's a while ago I read it and yeah. uh, but I think the interesting thing that I took from that is that someone had done more recent analysis which doesn't surprise me but more recent analysis on. The performance of small funds versus large funds and that mm -hmm. smaller funds outperform large funds and it's kind of it, it makes sense from an economical perspective and and like the scale of capital but at the same time it's interesting because the smaller funds usually have to take a lot more risk they can make fewer bets they're mm -hmm. probably smaller teams and they're usually more specialized because they like well we can't do everything and it's, it's quite interesting so as an lp do you back a well-known name who's really big who again backward looking performance has done well maybe maybe that is the right one to back or do you back the smaller ones that are trying to do something genuinely different and then don't have those constraints and and have to because you're small you have to take the risk because you also have to build a track record and and credibility and so on and, and it's an interesting it's an interesting um dilemma and a decision i think I, i'd love to speak to some lps generally on how like how do you think about who you pick as yeah. as EC funds to back um because it is very different approaches and and so on and i think having a blended model is probably something that to me naturally seems more interesting um but but yeah everyone's different right but i think there is mm. sometimes also oh here's a new fund we've never heard them they've only been around for a year who knows what they're going to do but at the same time that's the 
that's also sometimes why you, in just like the same with the startups that's also where sometimes you find the best opportunities because exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and and i do th i do have a sense that's changing with a few lps i know and i and like like you i would like to speak with more i'd like to have some on the show um I, i'm generally getting the sense that 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 the reason why they got into it in the first place is kind of being revitalized of like you know we want we want to get investing in exciting new companies we want we want to take risks we want you know calculate risk but we want to take risks that's the point of this we want to support companies that that excite us that get us out of bed in the morning and if uh you know a, a 20 year old fund that's just so tied up in its own bureaucracy and red tape and and panicking and just sitting there paralyzed with fear not doing anything isn't going to utilize their money then it's just like well well fuck it i think that you know the the original like you said the original sort of um way of thinking of a new fund was to you know be hyper uh, to, to hyper scrutinize it and you know to they're, they're a bit of an old boys club in terms of like you know new fund, funds popping up unless you have such and such experience unless you have such and such education you know things like that but that's that's changed over the last few years drastically and it's continuing to change at an accelerated rate but i think also the 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 the, the problem there comes down to the this the simple thing which applies to all aspects of startups and everything which is prices law right this idea that you know 20 percent of the, the individuals in an organization do only 80 percent of the work and uh, and so so in it you know funds are no different and so when you get a large fund where you know which has an enormous amount of people working there enormous amount of you know, analysts and associates and you know this and that and that then you know there's a lot of busy work happening mm. um and uh not and and everyone's scared to be the one to to make the wrong decision at a time yeah. of crisis <laughs> and no one wants to put their job at jeopardy in a time where everyone's being laid off and it's just like well so no one's doing anything <laughs> you know no, and i think there's also there's always a risk and i'm not saying this is necessarily happening in some of the most successful large vcs but there's always a risk with anyone but it's the same with any other companies when you build something really successful Mm. Your risk management becomes about managing downside risk. Right. Whereas if you're in the beginning, you have to take risk. To, you have nothing to lose. For nothing to lose, world, right? right? And yeah. you really go for things. Whereas once you have something super successful, you are almost hamstrung by your own your own success. And I think that is one thing to just. And I think some cultures are just very very good at 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 really challen um, channeling and encouraging risk taking in a way that is that should be done whether they're still like you know whether this big now or used to be small but that is very hard to do as an organization and how you build incentives and how you know um how people progress in terms of careers all those things are very hard to manage but i think ultimately one thing i just like to also kind of uh, come back to circle back to a little bit is is when you said you know with the lps and, and picking um what they really want to do the whole point of why they're allocating capital to vc is precisely that of you as an LP or as an investor, as a, whether you're a pension fund, a sovereign wealth fund, an endowment scheme, whatever it is, you can choose and you do choose different managers and different allocations of different asset classes. You mm -hmm. will invest in bonds. You will invest in equities. You will invest in riskier assets such as VC. And I think the thing that sometimes is, is really hard to do, whether you're a public market manager or I can imagine as a VC manager, is you see the world from this is my world. And it's easy to forget of what is the purpose the client have given us the money. And one of the things that one of my colleagues always used to say is like, if you, they weren't necessarily saying that you should sleep badly every night, but they're like, if you sleep too well at night, you might not be doing your job very well. Because right. ultimately, you have to think of why has the client entrusted me with this money, especially if you're supposed to generate alpha on a completely different level to what their other asset classes do. Because if you're trying to be too safe, and not producing and doing the job that they've hired you for, then you are fundamentally not fulfilling the purpose in the portfolio. And they mm -hmm. have other asset classes that do that. And ultimately, they allocate money to VC and to private assets because it behaves differently, because of the different risk tolerance. And they've allocated proportionately to that because of that. But if you see it as, oh, I can't take risk because I can't underperform, then you also won't take the risk that will ultimately allow you to outperform in a way that that they need you to and i think that is again bearing in mind what is the client what do they hire us for are we doing that right again sitting on capital is not doing that right mm. because, and, yeah. and would it be fair to presume as well that there's an element of um of 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 the job in that in that scenario where you're also hoping for your your clients to want to invest more so 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 you presumably you need to try and outperform the other um, investments they've made with uh, with other firms um, yes. 
to that purpose, right? So, so you you need to give them a win, not only a win, but a better win than the other wins that they've got. Yeah, and, you and don't show that, oh, right? Yeah. And show that you can replicate that, right? Um, so, yeah, I can definitely see that there must be a lot of sleepless nights involved in that. I don't think I could do that fucking job, that's for sure. <laughs> but, uh, uh, it's a, yeah, it's an acquired taste, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's it's interesting, but yeah, I mean, it's one thing to 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 work for clients to give them results, but it's another to to do them on, with that with that level of stakes involved you know yeah. um so um i wanted to ask you um to switch gears a bit i wanted to mm -hmm. ask you um about like uh general myths in in the world of of investing you know because obviously a lot of what you're doing is to demystify essentially a lot of a lot of things around around uh, financial services around funds or, uh, around being an lp etc so i mean what would you say are some of the, the the main myths or misconceptions or misunderstood elements of of um of this this world for one of a better term oh it's a tricky one i think there's many and i think some of them are more controversial than others and some of them might be like you know my personal opinions and let's go with the controversial ones first uh <laughs> yeah. Oh, I knew you'd say that. I don't know. I, it's also really good because I have to make sure that what I say is also very clear that that is my personal view and not personal financial advice. So you know, other people take a different view, and so I think the whole we'll put the big disclaimer up on. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah, not big, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I think some of it has to do with with risk and what risk is and diversification. Uh, they're not completely the same, but I think one thing is risk and volatility and in, in that not even the industry, no one in the industry can agree on what risk is. Everyone mm -hmm. has a different definition of what risk is. Um, and like I, I know fund management teams who literally have two year long discussions of what risk is to them, what it means to them. I kid you not. And they do this for a living. <laughs> they, do they at least take toilet breaks? It's a very long time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think they, they do allow that. But okay. it's, it's one of those. It's a very... It's a very complex thing, but ultimately, mm. I think people sometimes, as individuals, look at risk. Because something's very risky, of like, oh, you know, I might lose my money, and it might drop thirty percent. And it's like, yes, volatility. Some things, if you want to invest long term, and this is why long term investing is so important. You have to take risk to be able to generate a return. Without risk, you can't have the return. You take lower risk, you're not going to get as much return. And and but with risk and risk is is considered a negative word i don't think in investing it is and i think this is a thing that a lot of people see risk is bad because as humans we're told risks are bad and so we then equate to the same in investing but actually you have to take risk to be able to generate that return but on that journey you will have things move up and down like a roller coaster but over long periods of time that is hopefully still on an upward trajectory and i think what sometimes what people think is they see high risk equals bad i shouldn't do it and and if something's dropped 30 percent, it must be bad and therefore i must sell it and it's like that's the worst thing you can do you should not sell at the bottom and i think it's this whole how people think of risk needs to be talked a lot more about of like what is really risk is it you know risk um probability of of permanent capital kind of um um destruction in terms of you just lose all of your money that is to me what risk is um and moving of that over the time is, is not the same thing so i think part of how people look at risk and risk equals bad i think the industry isn't doing a great job at explaining what risk is and what the good things about taking risks are when it comes to investing um i'm not sure that's a myth so much as a as a bugbear of mine around you know even how people phrase these model portfolios of like cautious and adventurous and i think mm -hmm. sometimes it's like, well, people think like cautious because I don't want to lose my money. It's like, yes, but at the same thing for why people put their money in a bank account. It's like, oh, I, I'm not going to lose my money. People genuinely still think in great extent that if I put it in the bank account, I'm not going to lose my money because I can see where it is and it's not going to be worth less. And the sad thing is, is that when we live in an environment like we are now, for example, where inflation is so high, the only thing that is sure is that that money will be worth less in the future because inflation will eat away at that. And so, if anything, compared to investing that money, and of course, you should only invest what you can technically afford to lose, but you should invest over long term, is then you have the propensity to actually grow that money over and above inflation, mm. rather than if it's sitting in a savings account. So I think people looking at risk and loss is something that needs to be done a lot more about. And I think the other one is around diversification of what is, what is good diversification, what is diversified enough, 
should you as a 30 year old have your pension invested in a diversified portfolio across asset classes like should you you should be owning some bonds you should be owning some equities you should be owning some alternatives because that is a nice balanced portfolio my personal view is that so i'm 36 years old i will have to work many decades more before i can retire now all of my portfolio is in equities because that is the, the riskiest traditional asset class. But it's also, I have several decades for that. And over time, if we're looking at historic figures, equity markets have risen by an average 6% per annum. But not every year, right? But I want to take that risk because I have a very long-term time horizon. And I think people almost, there is this assumption and like default of like rule of thumb of like, you should be diversified across asset classes. Like, that depends on the investor. That depends on your circumstances. It depends on your age. It depends on the time horizon, the purpose you're investing for, and so on. And sometimes that diversification across certain things is not in your best interest. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of considered model standard advice. Um, and so I think that is something else that people think, oh, I should have a bit of everything. I personally don't think that if you're investing for multiple decades and you're very young, that that is a good thing to do. That is my personal view. And, and instead you have to look at how do I take as much risk as I want to, but also making sure I'm taking enough risk so I have a chance to actually grow my pension pot so mm. I can afford to retire. Um, sorry, those are just some, those were more like rants rather than myths, but. No, but it's, it's interesting stuff, yeah. Yeah, okay. And and um, yeah, I, 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 it was making me think about something then, which was, um, you, you mentioned about the diversification point, which. Um, yeah. You know, I think you could the, the same could be true when said about in terms of understanding of of those um, those areas, uh, those asset classes as well, right? Which is, you know, the same that we have uh, the same issue that we have with with funds in general. Um, you know, that maybe are going to be wanting to diversify or claim that they're going to be investing in a diverse range of of businesses themselves, and there's always a concern there by by the DLPs, well, you know, what do you know about these areas and so on? So it, it works all the way up, right, across the across the, the thing. So yeah, I think it makes sense. As long as you have, a, if you, it depends on your appetite for risk overall. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and in the context of return. Um, yes. And I think the, yeah. other, the other thing I'm gonna throw in as well is fees. Now fees really mm. matter, like when it comes to, to funds. So, because we, we offer funds, like open-ended funds, investment trusts, ETFs, like funds, but, they carry a fee um, that goes partly to the manager, that's the management fee, and then there's other, other fees that cost to, to manage the structure in terms of trading and legal and all of those things. And I think another thing that is very focused on in the industry is the fee in isolation. Now, I'm for, and that is what's happening in the industry overall, is that there's a push towards lower fees, and that's great for investors, it really is. However, sometimes, or actually quite a lot of the time, I find that this conversation around fees is like, this is an expensive fund. This is a cheap fund. Passive is great because it's cheap. Active is bad because it's it's expensive. Like right. that's a very simplified view of the argument because the fee in isolation means nothing. Ultimately, a fund is trying to generate a return, whether that is something tracking an index, whether that is something that where the manager is trying to make bets to, that, to, to generate a better return than the index. But return figures are what is that performance after fees? So you mm -hmm. might have a, and the only thing that really is is definitely guaranteed with an index tracker is that it's going to track the index. So it's going to deliver the index minus whatever the fee is. You can never outperform the index. That's, that's not what they do. It's like the index minus. With active, now obviously I'm, I'm slightly biased because I come from an active management background, but there is, and most active funds underperform after fees. They are terrible after fees, but there are those that actually outperform after fees. So if you, so for instance, I, I worked in a team where my boss used to run a strategy that over multiple decades had on average outperformed the index by 4%, 4 per year. Like you compound that up <laughs> and that is after fees. And therefore, if a fund costs, like if the, the ongoing charge on that fund is say 1%, but um, passive alternative or another alternative, doesn't matter if it's passive or not, is, is half a percent. A lot of people will think, oh, the half a percent is better. And it's like, well, well, no, you have to look at it in the context of if you actually deliver, say, on average, one and a half percent of that performance every year, then that is already taken care of in the one percent, whereas the other one might only outperform by 0 0.2 and actually you're worse off. And I think that conversation around 
feed is so laser focused on the fee in a standalone in a vacuum and it doesn't operate in a vacuum you have to look at it of what is the return after the fee and it's of course, this in the full context yeah yeah and of course the higher the fee the less likely it is that you're going to make a return because you have to both capture the the what you what you're charging in fee and more to be able to deliver a return to the investor so the fee is a hugely important but not on a standalone basis um and i think that's something else that i I'm a little bit frustrated within the industry that people don't talk about it in the context of what matters, which at the end of the day is performance. Hmm. And and look, I, I don't claim to completely understand all of the things that we're uh, that, that you deal with. So maybe you could shed, shed, shed some light on something you said there that I did, I'm not quite sure of, which is you mentioned about obviously a funds uh, a fund would need to ensure that they can get, get secure their fee before then you know being able to pay back to the investor, and that's part of that process. Um, sorry to just laser focus on no, this, but no, no, just no. while you mention it, it's, it's in my yeah. head. So, is it fair to to summarise then that that is the the number one priority for funds that they would you know they would prioritise the ensuring that their fee is paid uh, number one before um, any any return on investment for. for, uh, for, for no, I probably thought of that really badly. Um, it's not so much that it's a separate thing. A fee is there always. Like you earn right. a fee of like, you know, whether the performance of the fund does well or badly, like you take a cut of whatever like the, the return is. Um, and, and there's certain charges involved that just comes out to to the investor, which is why you might end up as a person investor with a negative return if that manager is not kind of covering that. So it's not so much that you're targeting getting your fees you will get your fee regardless but obviously what you're trying to do is outperform for your clients and you're mm. trying to outperform for those clients i would say any manager should try and outperform over long periods of time you will not outperform in every single year if you try to do that this is something else that we go on a lot about is that any manager whether you're running a pub well particularly if you're running a public uh publicly listed equities and so on you cannot outperform every single year and still be different. It's a bit like we talked about with VCs and picking the taking the contrarian bets. Mm. And you have to be different from the index that you're trying to outperform. Because if you're the same, you can't outperform, especially after that fee. Yeah. And so one of the things, the metrics that um, which I won't dig into too much detail because it's too, you know, too much for probably most people to want to get into. But there's one of these metrics called active share and essentially what that does. And we've spoken to big data providers when we're setting up till it. We're like, we'd like to get the active share on all of these funds. And they're like, the active what? Like they don't even know what active share is. Mm. And active share is really about it's a it's a metric to look at the fund of how different is it compared to the benchmark, the index or whatever that benchmark is that is supposed to outperform based on what it holds, but also in what proportion it holds those those things. So if you hold completely different things, let's say you, you measured against the FTSE 100 and I as a fund manager managing a UK fund own nothing that is in the FTSE 100 my active share would be 100%. I'd be completely 100% active. Right. Whereas if I held everything the FTSE 100 held and in its exactly the same proportions, I would have zero active share. And then you get into everything in between. And what I believe and what we believe at Tillit as well is that if you want to invest active, which you don't have to do, there's great passive solutions, but if you want to invest active, you, you're better off picking a manager who's truly active, who genuinely owns different things because they have conviction in those things, because then they have a chance, not every year, but over time to outperform because they take a different view to the market. Mm. And it goes back to that thing that we talked about earlier as well, around whether you're making a bet on a startup, whether you're making a bet on an equity, a publicly listed company, you have to take a different view to someone else for it to ultimately be able to have the chance to give you a return. Um, does that, sorry, maybe I went off on a bit of a tangent there. but No, that was really interesting, yeah. And and by the way, you know, throw as much data as you want at me in these things because if I'm learning, do you know what I mean? That's that's one of the main reasons why I love these conversations. It isn't just to have an interesting conversation. Like I, I want to learn stuff. That's I mean, for me, that's the whole point of a conversation in the first place is the exchange yeah. of information, right? So yeah, you know, feel free to, to dump things on me and I, and I'll ask more questions if I don't understand it. Um, so yeah, that's that's super interesting. So. Um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. I was going to ask you something else about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? No, let's not go there. Go <laughs> into like wherever, wherever you think is is interesting. <laughs> no, but well, all of it's interesting. That's the thing. I mean, so, so I mean, um, you know, within that, just to sort of dig a, a little bit deeper for a second, then. So, sure. um, so, so within that, that you, you mentioned, there's there's some some areas of that that you feel that people aren't 
sort of uh, not quite grasping is maybe not the right not not as not as um as willing to to yeah th th i'll just stick with that not quite grasping right <laughs> yeah um as, as maybe as best as they should in in the context of understanding the sort of you know that that, that area of active versus passive and so on what what other attributes of of active um investments like that do you think that 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 lps are, are struggling to to really grasp or, or is that pretty much the summary of it because it feels like there's a little bit more underneath the surface there perhaps um i think i mean i guess lps in the vc is is I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more things that they need to kind of look at and, and because i haven't worked in vc i'm not i'm not quite sure about that but i think in general as investors well, sorry investors more generally yeah, so yeah, yeah and in terms of as investors in whether you're investing passive active for me the big thing is performance after fees and fees and understand it like if you are looking at active i think that's the other thing of so on our platform um we have um a very good balance i would say across both active solutions and passive solutions depending on what people want mm -hmm. uh, we don't make a judgment uh we think that there are great active funds and i think a lot of the the robo advisors and other people who come in have only focused on passive um and there's been almost this this um synonymous thing of like etf equals cheap and I think one of the things that a lot of personal investors don't know, and, and, and again, this is not so much about people can't grasp this because it's difficult. No, it's because the industry is doing a terrible job and not explaining these things and not talking about these things. Um, is that because the ETF market has become so popular, it's become such a boon, it's really, really grown. There's now, I don't know how many thousand ETFs there are, I can't remember off the top of my head, but globally, there's so many ETFs out there that what's happened is what used to be the case of, ETF were launched because they were a cheap access uh, a way in to give personal investors access to the market without having the headache of trying to pick an active manager. Um, but the problem is that people now see the word ETF and they're like, I'm going to buy that because it's cheap. And because there have been so many new ones that have launched, those fees have been creeping up. And what I personally buy about mine is that the platforms that are offering ETFs or base their products on ETFs um, or any passive solution aren't being as straightforward perhaps as i think they should be on what is the fee on this one because it's it's such a draw and pull with etf has been fantastic branding done around that but it's not as simple as etf equals cheap anymore and i think that's something else that again is a mindful for personal investors like how do i know how do i even find the fee that's also like i sometimes go in because i'm a geek and because i look at our competitors and various things trying to find like the perspectives like the documentation that no other person in the right mind would ever try and even find never mind read but it, it's really hard on some of them to figure out how much how how expensive is this and i'm shocked sometimes at looking at the the how expensive these funds are because it comes back to that thing in return and and as mm -hmm. the end investor you're not going to make money in it if they're using things that aren't the most um, best value for money, essentially. Um, and I think that's something else that um, the whole ETF um, obsession in the whole industry has sometimes people have forgotten that this has now moved quite a lot and and become a lot more complex, unfortunately, and, and therefore needs a lot more clarity, transparency, communication from the industry to make sure that people know what they're investing in and know what they're paying. Um, and that's and, presumably what Select provides, right? That's exactly that. So we are super transparent about all of these things and also even how we even pick them in the first place. Passive for us needs to be the cheapest option that there is that does also track that market it's supposed to do in a very good way. And so for us, we have passive funds that are like charging six basis points, like 0.06%, but there's the other passive funds out there and usually in an ETF format um, that are doing exactly the same thing for three, four, five times the same fee. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's doing exactly the same thing. But you as an investor are not going to spend that time, again, coming back to time and so on, mm -hmm. comparing every single passive tracker that tracks the FTSE 100, for example. Who's going to do that? Oh, my God, like, you you know, lose the will to live. So that's why I think whether it's TIT or whether it's another platform, another way that you can try and figure out and get to the answer quicker i think is really important because at the end of the day if people if we aren't helping people actually generate a return i think we're turning away whole generations from the world of investing in the first place hmm. because if it's not doing what they think it's going to do people are going to be like well investing is just not working and then we have a real societal problem where no one's going to afford to retire um so i think it, there is actually a lot more going on here that platforms in the industry need to take responsibility for that 
unfortunately, I think isn't happening. It's a lot of focus on short term and getting people to trade because it's exciting um, rather than really helping people achieve the ultimate goal, which is to grow their money. Mm. That's, I'm really glad you came to that point, actually, there, because that's something else I wanted to to, to bring up and, and maybe chat about was the this idea that at least um, sort of uh, it, what I'm hearing, I, I guess what we hear about, I don't know how much truth there is to this, but what we hear about in uh, in passing, I guess you could say, uh, anecdotally, that's the word I was looking for, is that we have um, more and more younger people coming into money. Right, due to the creator economy and and you know other industries that um, that, are, that are that are making millionaires out of of young people, twenty somethings, thirty somethings, and so on, and their general investment strategy is much like their life, fast paced. They want to see quick returns on things. So, um, like you just said, the, the the industry that's that seems to be putting a lot of time and energy and money into encouraging people to to, to take that investment strategy and go for short term gains um, is exactly why the predatory um, aspects of this industry have worked so well, um, and this and why scammers work in general um, is is a problem. And like and, and again, I said, like I said, I think this is somewhat anecdotal. There's maybe some data to to go, you know, to to to, to this point. But um, it sounds to me like that's a that's that's a real concern for you. What 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 do you think can be done, either yourselves, you know, with Tillit to 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 bring people round who maybe have that mindset, these 20 somethings, these 30 somethings who who believe they just need to be investing in like, you know, crypto and, you know, these other sort of like apparent, you know, quick, you know, quick turnaround investments to something, to start thinking a bit more strategic, to start thinking more long-term, to start thinking about their retirement. Do you think that's something you and and, and Andrew or company could could tap into and, and, and how would you go about that? Um, you kind of stumbled into one of my, my, my hobby horse kind of <laughs> rants. And I think a lot of this comes down to financial education. I, yeah. I have a huge issue with how no one is taught anything sensible about money and investing in schools. 100%. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And we're taught all of these random... Now, I grew up in Sweden and I went to school in Sweden. I came here for university. But it's even in, in Sweden as well. Like there's such a lacking focus on what are real life skills and understandings that everyone is equipped with, regardless of how much money you have, understanding how to make the most of that and making sensible decisions is paramount for people to survive. And Mm -hmm. I think therefore, why aren't schools doing much more? And I would say much earlier, like Mm -hmm. if it was up to me, you'd go in and speak to children when they're five, six, like about very basic things, understanding the concept of like compounding, let's take that, which is one of the most important concepts in investing, which actually, because it's it's not about linear growth, humans actually find it quite hard to grasp because we as humans think of growth in a linear fashion mm-hmm. and compounding is all about exponential growth and that curve is completely different. So the whole thing of understanding why it's so important to start as early as you can, even with much less money. People think, oh, I should wait till I have money to invest. That's the worst thing you can do. Start early, start with like 10 pounds a month, like anything. And then you grow as and when you are able to do that. But you start early because the thing, the beauty with investing, and I, and I don't know if it was, if it was Warren Buffett or whoever that was, but around um, you know the eighth wonder of the world is like compounding, is because when you invest something, you then the first year you, you earn a return on that. But then as that grows, you earn a return on the base amount as well as what you the return that you earned previously. And so you end up with that exponential growth, which is really hard for humans to grasp. So if we can, if we can get If that is the only thing we can manage to get children to understand, it is a fantastic starting point for then why time, patience, long-term investing really, really makes a difference. Mm. And then there's a lot of other concepts, I think. It's not just about investing, but money and and, and taxes and all of those things, why that matters, I think, in schools. I think we've completely done a disservice to so many generations where we haven't prioritised that across all of, like, the globe. And I think that is something that we would, we're not, we, as with any startup, we have to be focused and manage to build something sustainable before we can start doing all of the million things we'd like to be doing. And and it's something that I'm very passionate about. It's also something that essentially every single one in our team is super passionate about financial education and what we can do there. And I think there is something that we can do. We can team up with other fintechs who are coming at this from different angles 
and other institutions who really believe in this and some fantastic um, charitable organizations that are trying to change this as well. But I think that's one thing which unfortunately people are now in their 20s and above and so on and the rest of us, we're screwed already. Like we have to do the best we can. But I would like to think that for the next generations we can do better than what we have done. Mm. But so coming back to, I guess, your other question, your main question, what do we do for people who are in the 20s and so on? I personally think it's, it's a really hard thing to change behavior. I think the one opportunity that I would say is the, it's, it's not necessarily the easiest, but it's the most important is pensions. It's how do we talk to young people about pensions? And it's not just like, oh, you should put money in your pension because it's really important. Um, but it's actually under, helping them be involved and engaged and understand that actually this is gonna be most like for most people, your biggest pot of money that you will have in your lifetime. So don't you want to put your money where your mouth is? Like you want to invest that in the things that you believe in, the world you want to see in the future. And so to get people to engage with their pension, understand where it's invested, potentially be able to, to be more in control of that yourself is I think the way in to make people understand the importance, but also understand the power that they have, whether that is through voting, whether that is through the capital itself of their pensions. And I think that's a real opportunity. And then just final thing I was going to say is that I, um, a colleague of mine told me about this survey I think she'd read around pensions of where, where they did a study of they, they gave um, one group of people a form to fill out how much do you want to invest for your pension and they filled that out and so on. And they gave uh, another group of people the same form but with the only difference is that they added a, a photograph at the top. Maybe the photograph on the other form was a photograph of them right now. Uh, or there was no photograph, I'm less sure about that. But the other one had a photograph of you, but aged to what you would look like when you're 70. Right. And people who had the photo of what you would look like in your 70s are like, this is your future you, put down a lot more to put into your pension. Mm -hmm. Because it's really hard to relate. That's, like, that's not surprising. You can't yeah. visualize it, right? It's, when you, you know, until you reach a certain age in life, you don't start thinking about these things. I think, you know, and also, you know, maybe having kids and, and building family or things yeah. like that, things yeah. like that. Start, yeah, you need more financial responsibilities before you start to appreciate um, these yeah. financial responsibilities. I wonder as well if the answer is in, like just sort of spitballing here as well, is, is you know, the responsibility actually comes down to a lot of these individuals um, in terms of the ones that are making good choices to be more vocal about it. So like, yeah. you know, you know that there, for a fact that there are TikTok creators or, or YouTubers out there or gamers or whatever that are probably being given some pretty good advice. They've probably got a good team around them and, they're, they're, you know, they're making some good strategical investment decisions, you know, in their, like you said, diversification in their portfolio, their pension portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and like, the problem is these these creators uh, don't tend to talk about money. And I think a lot of the, the problem actually comes around more broadly to just people not wanting to talk about money um, and being quite sensitive about that, especially when it's their own money. They don't want to talk about that. And that seems like a hugely missed opportunity because if you've got the exact audience that needs education on something, if you're a millionaire because of them um, in the first place and you're now realizing as you're developing in your career and you're making more money, oh, now I've got more responsibilities, I'm building a business. There needs to be some narrative about that as opposed to just, hey guys, just went bought a new car, just, you know, this is my vlog and I just, I went to a nice restaurant. It's like behind the scenes, what are you doing? How are you securing your empire? Because other people need to learn from that. Not, not least because it's inspirational and it might encourage the next wave of, of young millionaires, fine. And it's not about bragging, it's about, I didn't realize I needed to do this. I didn't realize I needed to set up this company. I didn't realize I needed to speak to this solicitor. I didn't realize this sort of stuff. Guys, make note. These are the kinds of things you need to know how to do. I think there's a huge responsibility within the own ecosystem of young entrepreneurs and and, um, and uh, millionaires to, to do something about that as well. I I couldn't agree. It's almost like someone's handed you a list of all of my bugbears, my Bobby Horse subjects, because this well, these are my bugbears too, you know. Exactly. Like, and I think, like, I, I wrote, I think the whole thing, whether it's entrepreneurs, whether it's other people, it's it's another thing that I wrote. So I wrote a blog, well, not a blog post. I wrote a LinkedIn post. It's a year ago now, actually, um, which a long LinkedIn post. And the starting sentence, which obviously is a bit uh, cheeky to get people to engage, but was talk dirty to me. And then oh, the, I saw that. Yeah. Oh yeah. The rest <laughs> yeah. of the post talks about because, and the reason I wrote that is because then it wrote, writes long about what do I mean by that is that we don't dare to talk about money. Money. Yeah. Is dirty word in this country in particular i would say in sweden we're much more open about money there are there are systems where you can find anyone as long as you have their kind of date of birth and so on you can find out how much they earn how much they pay in tax it's a super transparent system and mm -hmm. i think in general 
we're much more, we're not completely comfortable, no country's completely comfortable talking about money, but much more comfortable talking about money. And I think it comes back to, because of the lack of education as well. Yeah, it's all tied together, 100%. Yeah, it's all tied together. And if people think this is taboo, then we're never going to get there. We're never going to evolve. We're never going to do better. And I don't think it's about we need to sit around and talk about I earn this much, I invest this much. It's more what do you invest in or what do you do with your money? How do you make sensible decisions? It's not about how much you have. It's what you do with that. And and so I, I kind of think more and more people should – it sounds like you know my dinner parties are terribly boring and horrible and you would never want to go to them – but invite your friends around and talk about money like you know maybe cook them some nice food and provide them some wine to like break the ice but talk about money make it feel a natural thing to talk about and again it doesn't have to be about how much people have it's what you do with it well and that's the problem is that people either perceive it as gloating or um yeah. who, who hear it or people who talk about it are worried it might be perceived as gloating and it, and it will be like to some people and that's kind of like you know i think that there's i mean you over yourself then i think that's the thing i think these people like need to, we need to get over that and we need right. to yeah. move forward and then not you personally to get over yourself but no but you're if, right yeah yeah we need to just get over that and it's the same thing with like health it's the same with anything else you have to like express and articulate something to be able to move forward and get to a solution and a better decision um yeah. so I, I i encourage everyone to talk more about money it's just it's just like i don't think there could be a worse time though in some ways to have this conversation because like it's never going to happen, like because, at least right now, because now people are scared to talk about a whole range of issues yep. with fear of offending someone or, or or giving the wrong perception and so on. So this is just a, one of those other things on the list. And it's just like, well, fuck, you know, yeah. but to, but to, to go back to your point about education in schools, I, I completely agree with you. And I think most people agree with that sentiment. And, you know, you see people posting about it all the time, talking about it all the time. Why isn't it taught in schools? But the, the biggest reason isn't like, and I think we all know why in our Bones. But the bigger reason for that is for, for me, there's two main reasons why we're living in a, in a situation in the world where in Western society, the vast majority of individuals are suffering from mental health problems. And the first is lack of purpose. And the second is a fundamental misunderstanding of money and finance, in my opinion, because... Yeah, because of, you know, th these two things are tied together, right? Like a purpose usually comes from a, a very clear idea of what you want to do from a professional context, um, or not not like literally what I want to do as a job, but at least some drive, you know, which direction to be pointed at and having a clear idea of what you want to achieve and things like that. And then financially, money is the biggest contribution to stress. It's the biggest contribution to mental health issues, the biggest contribution to suicide. It's the biggest contribution to all of these things, to, to the health issues, both, you know, physical and mental, like all of these things. It's a huge, con you know, uh, issue. So, I mean, in some ways, it's no surprise that it's a sensitive issue. Yeah. Actually to talk about, because if you say, I've got a bit of money and I'm doing this, well, it's a sensitive thing to bring up, isn't it? Because of you know, everyone a isn't educated about it, and b we're not used to having the conversation, and c there's usually a battle someone is having with money in the background, like ninety percent of the time. You know, like someone is is worrying about money, is worrying yeah. about how to pay the bills, especially right now. So it's no wonder, I suppose, that it ruffles feathers if you were to start talking about look at you know, or it could be perceived as look at how sensible I am and what I've done with our money. But you know I guess, what I mean? Yeah, but I guess this thing of like it shouldn't just be about the sensible decisions. Why don't people talk more about debt? Like a lot right, of are right. in debt. and I think the thing is if people actually shared with each other like I'm in debt or I have these credit cards or whatever, it's like someone else might say, actually, do you know that you can pull those credit cards and get a fixed loan? You pay a less rate and it right. takes and you, and you kind of also help with that. It's not about shaming and, and making people feel um, I was going to make a reference to a completely different subject, but about shaming people into making life decisions. But um, I'm not going to make the reference. But there is, yeah, there is. Something. There is that, and and you know what's interesting is I find that the, the topic around this is very similar to parenthood. People don't want to hear advice on how to raise their kids in the same way they don't want advice on how to to, to look after their home and their family and themselves. Like it's, you know, money and and parenting are very similar in that sense. Like you know that you can't go up to a, a parent on the street. It's not socially acceptable to go up to a parent on the street and say, "Excuse me, have you considered trying this approach?" Like maybe maybe try that because I've noticed you're doing this. That's considered socially unacceptable. Now I 
I am inclined to think that that's fucking stupid because to be honest, there are a lot of parents out there, myself included, who make mistakes all the time and could probably do with someone who's experienced. Like if, if you know, if an 80 year old is walking past and he's raised five kids and has several grandkids and he walks past and he sees me doing something with my son and he's like, hey, you know, a good little trick, try doing this. Exactly. I'd be like, nice one, mate. Thank you. I'll give that a go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But for most people, they'd be like, fuck yeah. off, mind your own business. Yeah. How dare you? Right. And and yeah. that's and that's the issue that we're f tackling here is is people's egos ultimately more than anything else. Um, so you know it's no surprise because if you get exact same thing if you were sat at a dinner party like you said and it's like talking about you know oh you know I, oh, I've got myself into a bit of debt and you know I'm not really sure what to do about it it's stressing me out. People wanting to vent they don't want advice. <laughs> you start going well have you thought about doing that? Yes I've thought about it. Right <laughs> you know that would be the response like most of the time. And so that's the issue we have. Maybe yeah. I'm, I'm I'm not as optimistic about. It. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, maybe maybe I'm just in that mood today. If you catch me tomorrow, I might be like, yeah, I think we could. We, could we need to find a way it. to break that cycle. I don't know what the solution is. I think you know, and there's different approaches and so on. I think it's just trying to break some of those habits. I think would be even yeah. if it's like super slow and glacial pace and and in small communities, but it's eventually it gathers momentum. And I think it's both what we do as individuals as well as what is coming from top down of what's what's the government doing what are the corporations yeah. doing what is your employer doing everything it's going to start, it's going to start yeah. with children it's going to start at the early age absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. yes yeah. and and that's what inferior and this is a, maybe a topic for another day because i'm about to open a can of worms in one sentence but <laughs> this is what infuriates me about the fact that the um that there's been a lot of uh focus being put on um further education into sex at schools at younger and younger age um, and sort of like things like gender exploration and, and sexual exploration and things like that over something like this, which I consider to be far more important and fundamental to individuals' mental health, to be honest. I'm not saying it's not important, but fucking hell. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to teach anything to five or six-year-olds, um, you know, diversification in sex and gender, I don't think is as important as a fundamental thing I'm like, and look this is my podcast so i can say these things i don't yeah, absolutely. Care. But like, <laughs> exactly. but it's like you know what i mean like in terms of like in terms of really what's going to help people moving forward in their life i think you know and the, 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 what worries me about it is the amount of time and resources that's being put into that um and being you know people campaigning for it um over something which i would consider is far more of a contributor to not only serious health, mental health, physical health issues, but but suicide. Like we have to we call it how it is. Like people kill themselves over fucking yeah. money all yeah. the time. Like so, you know, that's a that's a more so than any other fucking reason. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's yeah, I think it's um I also just sorry, just a little bit conscious of time, but yeah, uh, yeah. I, there's a lot that needs to be done with the school system. I think that is the bottom line across the board of like really looking at are we teaching our children? Are we equipping them to be adults, to be independent adults? Right. And yeah. are we equipping them with the confidence and understanding they need to be able to live a happy life and, and make sensible decisions and not depend on the state? Like, are we doing that? I think the bottom line is, well, I don't think we're doing a very good job of that on a number of different areas. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's this topic, whether it's money, whether it's whatever it is, I think it's like looking at even like practical skills of like, should children be still taught Latin? And like, oh my, come on. Like, is in like, what what do children- Teach them to cook. Yeah, sorry? Teach them to cook. Yeah, how do you cook healthy food in a way that is yeah. cheap and sustainable? For example, like how, essentially at the bottom of at the end of the day, you want to make sure that we raise children to become independent adults. And, and I think there's a lot of things missing in that journey um, at the moment, and and so absolutely yeah, a lot more a lot more work to be done, unfortunately. Yeah. But we would love to, like especially on the financial education side, that is one of those things that we definitely have our eye on. It's a question of how and when, uh, but I think there's so much more that can be done there. And I think part of that change needs to come not just from the government, but needs to come from the private sector mm -hmm. in terms of how you really. Um, fast track that and get more broad range of views and support and education in that doesn't just come from the government yeah 100 percent. but no, i just thought it'd be interesting to get your view on that because of, you know given your position and and how you're positioning yourself in the market with your with your platform and, and that you want this transparency and, and demystification of things it feels like you know that it's definitely a a, a part of that there that, that that clearly um you're you're passionate about and your team's passionate about so that's great to hear um well, look, I know we're out of time. We do, normally these things we do a couple of hours, but you, you need to, to shoot off. And oh, um, yes. I think I think you can know that's fine. And look, I think you can clearly see why normally I, I do a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Four hours. <laughs> Easily. Yeah, yeah. I know. 
four hours on um, it. I feel like we only scratched the surface on a couple of things. So absolutely, I absolutely. Absolutely. I wish I could do longer, but not on this. No, no, no. It's fine. Don't worry about it. We'll just have to do it again sometime. Yeah, and it's absolutely. a good good excuse to do that. And then we'll have to try and refresh our memory on what we weren't <laughs> able to talk about and then pick it up. Um, but uh, but look, that's the idea, right? It's just it's, sometimes it's just nice. I think to have a chat and um and you know i hope people listening to this uh get get the same thing out of it that we got which is just yeah. uh you know conversation which um yeah. which doesn't happen enough these days it's just to you know we need we need to just take our time sometimes and explore ideas together and, and stuff so um lovely right. speaking with you thank you so much for joining me um and yeah keep in touch uh and i'll be following along and cheering 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 you guys along so good luck with everything keep up the great work no, thank you so much. And thank you again for having me. I've really enjoyed the conversation and, and I look forward to continuing offline, online, in, you know, in the Absolutely. future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anytime. Soon. Definitely. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a great day. Speak soon. You too. You too. Bye -bye. Soon. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for listening and or watching. Please like and subscribe and join in the conversation in the comments below.